Tuesday, May 19th, and um, <clears throat> we're normally home by this time, having been adjourned. I think in the 18 years I've been in the Senate, I've only been here twice past this date, and one was to June 7th or 8th. But here we are anyway. Well, we are home, though. <laughs> Yes, but when I was thinking of being home, I was thinking of it this is not the way you imagine less that. stressful being home. Yeah, really. So, so who do we have with us today? I saw Drew. Was the Secretary of State going to join us? Madam Chair, he wrote you a note. <laughs> Oh, just before our meeting. So if you want to look at your email. Okay. If you like, I can read that to you. Oh, no, he does not have anything to report on budget with the possible exception of keeping the business portal project alive to the extent we can. Well, um, all right, so I guess we don't need to do any budget stuff for them. And Commissioner Sherling cannot make it today. So we right. put him in on Friday. Yeah. So was Chris Herrick going to join us today or not? I didn't get a confirmation. OK. And then um, how about Erica Bourne? I did not get a confirmation from her either. Oh, OK. Well, maybe nobody needs any money. Well, the administration, the administration people will say they don't. I, well, no, I'm not so sure because this is budget adjustment. That's true. So there, there, I, I would have thought that emergency management might need um, to have some budget, but they might be taking care of it in other ways. So what I said in the invitation was that, um, we would look at places where they might need budget adjustment money where it wasn't being addressed someplace else. So the administration itself might be addressing um, uh, emergency management. And I know Mike Sherling wants to come on Friday. So I don't know if he has needs or what, but all right. So, um, well, we had scheduled this for an hour. So, Drew, do you have anything you want to say to us? You'd like more money. <laughs> I was going to say, just to clarify, EMS would like more money. Uh. Um, so we're continuing to, um, you know, work through with services on, you know, what their problems and um, the current situation is. Uh, we've scheduled our advisory meeting for 10 o'clock on Thursday morning. It's a another Zoom call, but if anybody would like to attend, you're welcome to um, attend and ask questions. And then we'll be doing a, a VAA meeting early next week to um, you know, reach out to all the ambulance services and kind of get a, a feel for how they made it through the last uh, two months. Um, I know that for us, we got our second um, uh, revenue check from uh, federal government, HHS money, uh, which was uh, a total of $1,700 for our organization, which is appreciated, but doesn't put a huge dent in the in the uh, the losses. And that seems to be, from what we're told, the last uh, round of funding that's now coming from the federal government. So $1,700? Yes. So that was our total. Hold, uh, hold on. This is the hospital. Anthony, would you take over for a second? Seventeen hundred dollars. Yep, that was the um, that was the second round of. Uh, I'm not going to spend it all at once. We're, we're hoping to stretch that out for the next, you know, month or so. Jesus Christ! Oh, that, that, that's shocking. So <clears throat> now, more than ever, our request in front of appropriations is ever more critical. Yeah, how much did we say we were going to ask for? I forget. What was the number we were asking for? Remember? Uh, 3,900,000. Right. 3.9. Yeah. 
compared to seventeen hundred dollars. So really, <laughs> um, we've actually had since our last discussion. Uh, I've reached out to first response squads and services, and they're uh, very uh, excited to hear that the other parts of the bill that we were working on earlier this year, uh, with the education and the service, the new service level. Um, they're, they're very excited to hear that that's not uh, completely off the table and that we're moving forward with it. Um, I did have a nice conversation with the health department earlier this week. Uh, we think we have a, a good proposal for our Thursday meeting and we'll be able to uh, have all those kind of compromises worked out before your meeting on, on Thursday. So, Great. <clears throat> Actually, I brought this up, but I'm on this transition task force, which is supposed to be preparing ourselves to better be able to respond to future emergencies. And I brought up the EM, EMS as part of this, some of the things we should consider solidifying and supporting better for the future. And we are gonna meet, meet supposedly we're gonna, this committee is gonna meet with the, someone from the administration on Thursday afternoon. So maybe we'll be able to bring it up there as well, just to keep it front and center in people's minds. So the, the one of the things that we talked about was how to, uh, if we could have Medicaid, I think this would be a really important step is to have Medicaid actually pay for non-transport calls, but just treatment calls. Because if Medicaid reimbursed for that, then other insurers might do it also. And it wouldn't help Medicare calls, but um, I think Drew said, you said there's a national group working on that at a national level for Medicare. We are, and I guess before I go too far, um, I should mention that this is National EMS Week, so it's a very timely discussion. Oh. So uh, if you do get a chance to talk to your EMS groups around, it is National EMS Week, so um, it's not, they don't get a lot of credit, so um, it's, it's a good week to kind of honor what they do. Actually, they got they got lots of credit this, today on the Senate floor. That's great. Anne did a really nice job of reporting that bill. Did you hear it, Drew? I did not. No. She did a really nice job of laying the the framework for it. And then Dick did a nice job reinforcing it with his conversation, de describing his conversation with Jim Baker, and mm -hmm. um, and sort of the inspiration for the bill. And that was that was good too. I'll have to go back and listen. <laughs> There's a so, lot of endless conversation on the Senate floor this morning, but that was pretty good. <laughs> so, Anthony, when you meet with your administration people on your transitions team, oh, this is more of a permanent solution than transitions. The one about having Medicare, Medicaid. Yeah, that's and true. That's more of a permanent going forward solution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are, are you, are there other, I am not sure that we can put in more requests for EMS in the budget adjustment. We just put in 3.9 million. Yeah, we, we um, did pretty well on, 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 on this piece. <laughs> It certainly beats the one seventeen hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it does. No, I, I think as far as what you know, our the EMS immediate needs are the uh, money that you've put in, and we've discussed previous, will address those immediate needs. As we look at kind of the transition component of it, and what does EMS <laughs> moving forward? I think there's mm -hmm. a fair amount of discussion as to how to make sure that we have a healthy and strong, resilient. Uh, EMS system in Vermont, um, but you know, in the short term, if the, uh, the funding that you've already put forward comes through, that will make a, a huge difference in kind of stabilizing and assisting us to recover some of the personnel that have been lost uh, as a result of the COVID and um, <clears throat> we lost. So, so Anthony, I can't remember if it was. Anthony or Brian, when you were talking about your committee, your groups before you, Andy Perchlick, you said that he suggested that maybe we should have one big bill about things that were in the, that we did in this emergency that we should make, um, that we should address for 
to be better prepared for the next um, emergency? Yeah. yeah, not necessarily make them permanent, but make them so that they can click into place in, in terms of another emergency, as opposed to having to pass 10, other, 10 new bills each time. Right. Brian? So I, I had mentioned to our ta to the transition task force that GovOps might be doing that for the issues that we deal with in terms of the municipalities and the kinds of things that we did this time that maybe we would come up with a, I don't know what to call it, but I mean, obviously be a le piece of legislation that would allow certain things to be kicked in automatically whenever an emergency is declared. Right. We but did Brian have his hand up. Yes, right, sorry, yeah, we did right. have a meeting of the lessons learned group this morning and Chris Pearson, who's our subgroup leader, um, brought that up and I credited Andy with coming up with, I mean, he was the first one that I heard say it. Now, whether there'll be a packet, that was used as a description of, of the structure. So a packet of bills that deal with different things, kind of up on a shelf, imagine, imagining a shelf. And then if there's a, a further emergency, whether it's you know a flood or a natural disaster of some sort or a virus, you would be able to reach up on that shelf and whatever you needed from that packet, it would already be tailor drafted and you in essence could redraft it with different dates and it would just save a lot of time and testimony, I think. Couldn't, couldn't you just, couldn't we just actually figure out what the issues are that need to, from our committee anyway, I don't know about others, um, the issues that we made emergency um, legislation around and draft them in such a way that we could actually pass it so that upon the declaration of an emergency, they would just kick in. You wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to um, get them down and redo them. It would, <clears throat> there would be some things that would kick in if, there, if it was a statewide emergency, some things that would kick in if it was an emergency that precluded you from meeting in person, <laughs> I, I, that's what I had imagined that we would actually pass something like that now that would automatically kick in so that we wouldn't, be, can that be done, Betsy? Yes, for example, um, OPR's license uh, or licensing statutes uh, allow for the temporary licensure of people from out of state in the, in when there is an emergency situation. So that's an example of a current law provision that I think OPR um, brought to life and used during the state mm -hmm. of emergency. And you could similarly craft a permanent statute that only would come to life when uh, there was whatever emergency, however you wanted to define the emergency in that statute. Mm -hmm. That's the way I was imagining it too, was what, what Jeanette explained. Yeah, Ryan. I know oftentimes, Betsy, we talk about uh, putting a burden on a future legislature. Is there any risk of, of running afoul of that sort of understanding that you don't pass something now that puts the future legislature in, in sort of a different position? Uh, I don't think so in the way that we're talking about potentially, or you're talking about potentially structuring this language. You would be in this bill proposing to amend or add law that would be permanent law going forward, and that would only spring to life when the conditions that you impose in the law um, occur. So, in the future legislature, if they don't agree with that provision, they could always just repeal that law. Um, just okay. like you could repeal, a future legislature could repeal our current laws if whatever ones they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So, what makes sense to me is, um, <clears throat> um, Anthony, you're looking at transit. So you're looking at transitions into a more normal state, right? Basically, yes. It's and then Brian, <laughs> Brian, you're looking at lessons learned that could potentially be permanent lessons. Yeah, and, and me too. Okay. I just sadly missed this morning. Oh, oh you're on. Okay. I so, am in, I'm on a different subgroup than Brian is. I, uh, yeah. I'm on the one Becca's leading. So, so it actually you might and be I are relevant. the only ones that aren't on a group. Well, you're, 
That's because your chairs. What? That's because your chairs and, and, and you were happily liberated from this exercise. Yep. But I do think this exactly the yep. legislation you're talking about is a piece of lessons learned. We have learned that we need to have statutes that can <laughs> nimbly kick into action the minute the conditions require them to. Yep. And I, I think that is a big lesson learned that we uh, could have that ready to go. And they, those, you know, hopefully in the future when something awful happens that these laws could be uh, immediately go into uh, emergency declaration mode. So what, what I would like to do for our committee and that we should, um, um, I'll write a note to all the chairs and when we have a chairs meeting, talk about um, th doing that so that the lessons learned groups can can um, look at those. And then um, following Andy's thought is, then, then we should put together our, our list of what we would like to see immediately pop into place right. if there's an emergency and we can tailor it to, um, I mean, like one of the things that Lauren talked about the other day was um, <clears throat> a lot. They did the um, the emergency legislation around um, medical people for this one, but they need to have a more comprehensive. From what I understood, she said they need to have a more comprehensive um, act that would allow them to do temporary licenses to, for the people who are affected that they need to deal with the particular type of emergency. For example, in Irene, they didn't necessarily need health people, they needed engineers. And in if we had a, a nuclear accident, which we won't anymore, but then you'd need a particular kind of temporary right. license probably. So um, we could we could make a list of all of those things and then see what kinds of um, when they would kick in. So if, if we can all start making that list maybe that as we remember it and <clears throat> we can take a lot of it from the bills that we passed, they're there. Absolutely. We have a and template. If there, yeah. If there are other things and then we can, um, then we can just have Betsy draft it up and then it'll be there. So if we do a big massive bill that has different sections for different committees, I mean, different areas of jurisdiction, that's fine. If not, we'll have our own bill. Does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sounds good. Brian. I did hear back from Tucker. I don't want to necessarily change the subject, but- Okay, I'm no, not... let's do though. Yeah. Yeah, Thank in you. case anybody else gets a question. Let me, I just got to flip over to my email. I had a question from the uh, folks at Rutland City Hall about S-344. And the question was, under normal circumstances, Rutland City would be obligated to set the tax rate at a level that would generate the appropriate revenue for the budget that was approved by the voters in March. S-344 gives the Board of Aldermen the ability to adjust the municipal property tax rates for calendar year 2020 which gives them the ability to set it at a rate lower than would normally be required. The issue is our fiscal year runs from July to June. So the question is, can the Board of Aldermen only adjust the rate for the six month period in 2020, or as long as they act to set the tax rate for the whole fiscal year <laughs> before that date, they could adjust it down for the entire fiscal year, yes or no. And I thought that I knew the answer to that, but I wanted to double check to make sure. So I did ask Tucker for uh, his reading of the uh, legislation. And here's what he wrote. The intent, parentheses, and result was to allow extensions, penalty waiver, and tax rate reductions for calendar year 2020. When this was discussed in committee, I highlighted that most municipalities use a July 1st start date for the fiscal year. However, the default is a January 1st start date because of the variance in fiscal years. The bill ultimately was aimed at calendar year 2020 to ensure consistency between municipalities. So that's what I remember. 
So in essence, yeah, they can only do it for the six months, I guess. Uh, unless we change it. I mean, it well, may... It, it, with all due respect, it took two weeks to get it signed into law. Um, I, I, I don't know we... I yeah. understand that. But I also understand that if enough municipalities come back to us and say, we actually would like to adjust our uh, tax rate down, uh, you know, if, if enough towns come to us and, and, and ask for that, I think it's something we could do something about. I, I think that we could we could do that actually as a, a regular bill also. It doesn't have yeah. to be because they wouldn't be doing that until, um, I mean, they wouldn't make it effective until January anyway. I do remember now, and Brian, I was wrong because I, I, but I remember um, the league weighing in on that and it getting pretty complicated and right. they said go with 2020 and then towns would deal with it afterwards. Yep. So but, I'm gonna send that back to them now. Okay. Thank you. So but, we could ask but, the league to um, find out if enough towns would like to do that, that we could just change right. it. I, I would ask Karen Hornet now actually, uh, because if towns are considering that, they're gonna, they're gonna be, you know, July 1st is coming up fast. But they'll, uh, but they can do it for the calendar year now anyway, then they wouldn't have to make the decision about the second half of their fiscal year until. The problem is we don't meet, uh, we're not gonna be meeting in the fall. Well, we may be, but. <laughs> No, no, we can do we're it. not going to be meeting it in a in a way to be to affect in real time the January through June. Right. We can do it now, but it's not an emergency. Right. We don't have to have it done before July first. Right. I mean, we have to have it done before we go away if we ever do go away. That's the end. Don't you laugh when I said that. <sighs> Sometimes I feel like we'll be here forever. <clears throat> okay. All right, so um, we have eight minutes left with Betsy Ann before she has to run, I think. Is there anything else we wanna talk to yeah. her about right now? Uh, thank, thank you, Betsy Ann, for your email and your harmonization, your harmonization email. Are we talking about that when you come back? Yes. Okay. You mean the uh, 233, blending at 233 and 438. 233 and 438. No, we're talking about that on Wednesday. Oh, okay. I, I think, aren't we? Sometime. I think we're doing, when, when we come back, I mean, next we're talking about, What's 448, 948, 948? It's a bill that just came to us from the house. Let me check and see what 948 is. I'm looking for my list of bills. It's an act relating to temporary municipal proceedings provisions in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. I think, yeah, but I don't remember which one this was. Uh, well, we'll have oh, joining us. There's too many bills. What is it, H498, H948? H948. Nine, four, eight. Oh, Just, it should be bills in committee. Well, I don't know if it got to our committee yet. Uh, it's right here in our committee. Uh, we have it on it? our page. Yep. And okay, says, we do. Okay. Yeah, and it is. It is. Oh, how do you read the text of it? Well, that's why I went to the- 948 building. says, notwithstanding any provision to the contrary during an emergency, um, a municipality is authorized to conduct any municipal quasi-judicial proceeding through electronic oh, means. Oh, quasi-judicial proceedings through electronic means. 
Yeah. Provided they comply with all the requirements of the conduct of the proceeding. Not required to designate a physical location. Okay. Right. And inspection requirements, our favorite. Yeah. The yeah, Board of the Civil Authorities shall not be required to physically in inspect any property that is a sub subject of an appeal. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about when you come back, Betsy Ann. But if you want to talk about it now before you go, we can just dispose of it. That uh, 948 would be a Tucker bill. Oh, right, right. And Tucker isn't with us yet. Karen, this, you like this bill, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, Karen Horn with the League of Cities and Towns. And um, we think that the language in the bill would just make it clear because there's some um, you know, debate out in the field yeah. whether these things are um, allowed or not. So in both instances, this would just make it very clear. And I so think this, that this we took, we took this testimony on this bill yes. and, and then we were ready to do it and then the house did it and used the exact same language so this is the bill right. we would have passed if they hadn't passed it first correct correct right. it did look kind of familiar yeah we are well prepared for this <laughs> so actually do we want to just do something with this bill right now yes okay <laughs> although it would be polite to wait for tucker i suppose oh, that is true that is true We'll wait for Tucker. Bye, Betsy Ann. Bye, Betsy. What are you going to do in finance? Oh, they're taking up the OPR bill and S-233. All right. So I'll check back in with you when I get out of there, if you're still on, and give you yeah. an update if you're still here. Let well, us know if they have any questions. OK, thanks. OK. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Block. It's a tough group. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever gone to had to go to finance. Oh, yes, I have. I have. I have. I have several times. Yes. Um, Under right, different so leadership. Are there other um, budgetary issues that we need to talk about? I guess nobody else needs money. Municipalities, do you need? <laughs> oh, we're gonna, we are going to be in a world of hurt. We're trying to collect that information now. But um, you know, if you've got a local option tax, that, that revenue source is down. 40, 50 percent. I just got from a town over in um, Chittenden County that town clerk fees in the last month were down 40 percent. And and now we've got, um, you know, final pay, payments of property tax. So we're we're that's my next job is to figure out like what we're down in the current year on property tax. Are you will you be able Karen, will you be able to give us a notion fairly soon about uh, how many, how much b below expectation those revenues came in at the uh, the property tax? Um, oh, we're hoping so. We sent out a uh, survey last week, and the it, the responses are due back this Friday. And then um, we're, I'm also going to send out a specific question to the towns that had April and May property tax due dates and see what their shortfalls have and been. Did you say local option taxes were down only 40%? I would have thought, given they're mostly meals, rooms, and alcohol, it would have been down even more. Um, the few, I, I'm not saying that across the board, but the few towns that I've heard from, it's been like 40%, 40, 50%. Yeah. So can we get, is there any way of getting a, um, an estimate of the, the shortfall that came to towns because of, I mean, I know like um, Barry Town um, yeah. rents out the opera house for things and Bellows oh, Falls right. rents out the opera house and the theater is closed and yeah those those kinds of things that are very 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 clearly related to COVID-19 because they were canceled right yeah and we have started getting um, information from towns about that also they've been volunteering it actually haven't asked them specifically I don't believe that was in the survey, but I'll go, actually, I'll send you the survey questions. That's what I'll do. That, that would okay. be great because, of course, revenue, parking, 
also would be included. Yes. Revenue what? Parking revenue is a big income producer in Woodstock and several other towns. And Try Montpelier. And Montpelier. And that most towns have either waived it or not collected it. And um, and it's so parking revenue also is down considerably in terms of municipal down revenues. Right, right. The, so in Montpelier, I know that they just have not collected parking meter um, right. parking meters for probably two months. Um, and they're, I mean, those are not essential employees either. The people who collect the parking meter, you know, coinage. So yeah, those right. those are right down to close to zero, I would suspect in most towns. Yes, I, I, ours actively saved during the pandemic, you know, during the COVID crisis, not, they're not being collected. Yeah, so yeah. Money. I think about Montpelier, it's just that nobody's been driving into town for a long time. There's just no, nobody's parking, hardly at all. Nobody's parking, but also the, um, they, I believe they had furloughed a couple of the people who did right. the, um, collections yeah yeah <clears throat> so the other thing i was thinking of that and i know that this is a longer term project but i wondered if there's any way of getting some kind of an estimate of how what it would cost to start the digitizing um process and i was i was just doing some back of the envelope stuff the other day and i was thinking if you had I don't remember how many towns I was thinking and um, <clears throat> if it caught, I came up with a figure of $750,000 to get started. And are you talking about digitizing all records or just the land records? I'm talking about land records because that's what, we, that was our concern and that's what, I, I right. think that digitizing all records might be nice, but I think we need to start with land records anyway. I agree. What do you, what do you mean by getting started? You say 750 to get started. What do you mean by get started? Well, I think that they're going to have to, they're going to have to start um, hiring the, if the committee is working on um, setting up some kind of standards and on trying to figure that out. And I think they're probably going to go pretty quickly on those, on those issues because they've been dealing with it for yeah. such a long time. And Tanya Marshall has some really great ideas. So I think that they're going to have to start um, having towns um, do it, hire somebody or get the software or whatever it means to, to start doing it. Well, and, and we have real data in terms of what towns have spent so far um, on doing this. So I think actually we could uh, extrapolate from that. And, and actually, if you wanted to get it started in budget adjustment, worth a try. Why not? I don't, I don't know. I was just thinking that it was so clearly COVID related. It the is. Need to, the need to do it that we might be able to justify um, requesting some money for it. And I guess, I, 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 don't, I don't know the best way to go about doing it and what specific pieces, Anthony, as you pointed out, what we mean by getting started. I don't know. So the um, committee, the task force is having a meeting on June 1st. Oh, great. In, in, in the afternoon, that's the first meeting and, and part of what they wanted to do, or we, I suppose I should say, wanted to do was um, put up some models of how it's worked in other states, you know, and what the standards are and what the protocols are, just to get everybody sort of on the same page. But yeah, uh, so I don't know about the numbers, like dollar piece. We, um, we, I think we could construct it. We heard good testimony about the dollars. Okay. Uh, didn't we? I'm, I'm recalling, I'm just looking for it now, actually. That was, yeah, it was about um, what it costs to maintain the, the records <clears throat> with, the, with the vendors. Yeah, um, and, and what it costs to, to, to do it. And, yeah. um, and we could get additional testimony from that really terrific clerk who gave us those. Carol Dawes, maybe. 
Well, Carol and another one, and the uh, and um, Lucretia maybe from Killington. Lucre yeah, Lucretia and yeah. Donna also. Donna. Yeah. It it was Donna who gave us the numbers. And I oh, think okay. that what I have here is that it cost them thirteen thousand dollars a year to maintain. Yeah, hold on, I'm I'm just getting but there. They but they didn't keep track of what it cost to um, actually do the digitizing because that was done by um, mainly by town employees, and so they would have to just come up with a. <clears throat> if they want it done quickly, they're going to have to get the equipment. They could might be able to get some numbers on just getting equipment so that everybody has standard equipment and buying um, into some kind of a vendor, the vendor, how much it would cost to <coughs> buy the software from a vendor. Yes, and very important to have them all have the same platform. Well, yeah. at least the talk to each other, like ATM machines, they don't have to, they don't have to all have used the same. This is the way I understand it. They don't have to all use the same exact software <clears throat> as long as the software interacts. And the only way I can think of that is like an ATM machine. Brian and I bank at different places, but we could go to the same ATM machine and stick our cards in. Right. Somehow no, the spine is in the ATM machine. The single standard, whatever the single standard <laughs> is, it needs to be. Up. It was Bobby Brimblecombe, Bobby Brimblecombe, oh, who had okay. such terrific data on, on it and the and terrific finances on it. It cost two, the licensing fee was $225 a month. And um, they started yeah. they started doing this work in 2010 and it's cost her so far $27,000. Right. Okay. And, uh, but we could ex get more data on that. Um, and, but she, she had the, the mo most specific finance, financial data, uh, test. Yeah. Okay. I bet Carol could get her, uh, her budget on it as well. Yeah, and, and Lucretia down in Killington had done the report on town clerk fees last year, you know, she's the sort right, of yep. the keeper of that data. So she may have some more generalized data. So if they could get us something, they're meeting on June 1st, what day of the week is that? Uh, uh, it is a Monday, it's a Monday. Is it next Monday? No, wow. next Monday's the 28th. Oh, okay. <clears throat> no, sorry, next Monday is the 25th. Next Monday's the 20th. It can only be so many things. Yeah. It's next <laughs> it could be 30, 30 things. <laughs> next Monday is the 25th, and it's Memorial, it's Memorial Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it's not Memorial Day. Yes. Yeah, that'd, that'd, be, that'd be the one day they wouldn't pick. This Monday is the 25th and it's Memorial Day. Uh. It's, it's the federal government telling us it's Memorial Day. It is not really Memorial Day. We all okay, know I'll, that. I'll take as many Memorial Days as we can get. I have a big garden to get in. <laughs> the veggies um, are desperate to get in the ground. Um, so Jane would have liked to have us get all the stuff to her by the 25th but if we can just say that we're going to try to come up with some thing and send her a note telling her that and that we'll try to get it to her by the first because they want it they are hoping to have budget adjustment uh ready to be voted on by the 12th i think that's what she said isn't it so if we could even just ask for some kind of a placeholder to get this going. Yes, I, I, that would be great. Okay. But Karen, if you could get us any of that other information beforehand, that would be yeah. great. Like yeah. revenues. I'll, right, I'll see what I can do. 
Okay. Anything else, committee? No, you know, actually, I think, Jeanette, that's a big thing, is if we can get a handle on some of the basic lost revenues from municipalities as a result of COVID, that would be huge. I mean, and the land records, but <coughs> before we get to the digitizing the land records, just that larger piece of what municipalities have lost as a result uh, right. of COVID is, I think, a key piece in this whole federal discussion about how much support we get and important for us as a state to understand. Yeah, so we are working, part of the reason we did this survey, well, a dual purpose, one is to get you good numbers, and one is to actually get good numbers to the National League of Cities, where they are supporting the um, legislation at the federal level, whatever that turns out to be, but hopefully with aid to municipalities and states, aid for lost revenues to both municipalities and states. Okay. And, and I think that um, <coughs> given what was proposed by the House and then by um, the Senate, the SMART Act, I don't know if you've seen that, that, that there would you know, Vermont would fall below all the minimums. So there would be a minimum app allocation to places like Vermont and Wyoming. And I don't know who the other one is. Maybe Montana Delaware. or North Dakota, probably. North Dakota. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Montana has the same population we do in about seven times the land mass. <laughs> and the only reason I know that is because my daughter lives in Montana. <laughs> well, they, they don't have trouble social distancing then. They don't have trouble at all. And they have very, very few cases. But they're suffering. <clears throat> yeah. It, it no, isn't the space. It's the natural human tendency to move closer to a person to speak. It, it's fascinating to watch, you know, as you, as you... Yeah move into physical interactions with people. There are just some people who just naturally have to get closer to you. South American countries, don't they? Like that. Okay, so anything else we wanna talk about about money? Hmm? Brian, do you need some money? <laughs> I'm all set, Madam Chair, thank you. All right. Yeah, could I ask Senator Colmar, how did it go this morning? I wasn't able to listen to the Senate floor. Oh, it was a great session. No, 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 your issue, <laughs> our <laughs> issue. Oh, yeah. Right. I know, I was sort of stringing Karen along. Um, okay. I don't understand exactly why, but we did not take up third reading of that bill. Oh, you didn't? No, so this afternoon in the all Senate caucus, we are going to allow people to ask any further questions they might have. Oh. And there, therefore, tomorrow, I assume, the uh, ground will be laid to grease her right through. Oh, OK. Well, I'm so glad I asked then. I'll listen to the caucus. Yeah. I, I don't know what other questions people can <laughs> ask. I have the uh, stuff from Tucker about um, what happens if there isn't any budget by July 1st. And then I have your list of the municipalities that would be affected if they can't do this. Right. I don't know what else. Okay. And I don't know if you've gotten um, <clears throat> a couple of the people down here wrote letters to um, people who had concerns and told them that they had no intention of increasing the budget. They were pa passing a level funded budget. That was what the best thing for them to do right now was. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I do I think, think you'd have to be out of your mind to, to propose an increased budget <laughs> right now. <laughs> or someone who didn't want to run again. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, I, I don't know that it was opposition. I think because we're used to having caucuses and casual conversations, things come to the floor with more shared understanding. And I think some people were confusolated by it and or when some, I don't know. And, and then, they, then it becomes a little bit of a shark 
feeding frenzy where three questions cause other people to want to ask more questions. And so, and, and it, even if there's not really a problem, and I, I, it's hard for me to see any uh, this problem. Morning, you're right. This morning was a good example of that. Actually, this morning, I thought there were some real concerns about yeah. that one bill, but. You mean the liability stuff? Yeah. Um, anyway, so I don't know. <clears throat> Brian, would you agree? There's not, it's like people weren't really opposed. They just didn't quite get it and weren't comfortable yet. Right. I think there was also an attempt to make a point about uh, those communities that haven't passed school budgets not being sort of taken care of. Oh, sure. Um, and this is, has nothing to do with school budgets. If, if right. people feel strongly on that issue, we could probably draft something else. But this is strictly the other part. So, um, I, thought the maybe, I thought the education committees were working on the school budget stuff. Well, yes. they're not. That's the problem. Right. They're well, not getting I, anywhere. They're working on it, but they're not agreeing on anything. Well, yes, we have. Uh, yes, we, we have a real challenge there. And I and, and the schools need us to solve these problems. So our 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 warfare. I mean, we have to solve these issues for our schools because our schools desperately need clarity on how to move forward on either reducing their budgets. What are they going to do about it? What are they going to do about all the contracts they haven't signed? They desperately need clarity from us. Um, but I would I'd go back to one of uh, we one of our school districts, Rochester and Stockbridge, actually have scheduled a vote for the end of June and are and are have created a, a, again to go to the creativity of our towns and school districts. They've figured out how to do this effectively and and hold the vote in, in by mail and with safe physical distancing. So they 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 they're working it out. They're figuring it out. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump <coughs> away from schools because that really isn't our, our jurisdiction. But I think that um, a couple of the things that we need to make clear in the, around this issue um, that we were talking about is that municipal school, when school budgets are passed in towns, it impacts other school, it impacts the state education fund. When municipal budgets are passed, it only affects the people in that town and that municipality. And I think that people who haven't been involved in municipal governments don't necessarily understand that and don't, don't know that. <clears throat> and the other um, thing that I think we need to, yeah, I just had a, a senior moment here. Um, there was something really, really important that I, that we needed to make sure we addressed, but I can't think of what it was. So there you I have did, it. Um, I did call Senators Baruth and Hardy last Friday. I hadn't heard back from them, but I left a message <coughs> inquiring what might, what's concerning them. So I don't know. Did it, did it, do you think it revolved around the idea that they would pass bigger budgets? It, it's kind of hard to say, right? I don't I, know. I, I was unclear about their... Concern. What was the question? I'm sorry. What Senator Hardy and Senator Baruth were opposed to in terms of the bill that Brian was talking about. I have no idea why they were, they, if you remember, they also voted against the pilot project. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, but I think I we need to, huh? Go ahead. No, go ahead, Karen. No, this is completely different subject. Okay, well, if I think of that other thing that <clears throat> when Brian talks about the bill, that um, I, I think we need to be very clear about is that municipal budgets only affect that municipality. If they don't have a budget, they can't collect taxes and they can't pay any bills. They can't do anything. And, <clears throat> oh, the other thing was, so um, 
there is no default like there is with schools if you right. don't pass yeah. it it defaults back to 87 percent you can borrow up to 87 percent of last year's budget that isn't true with towns and a couple people had suggested to me maybe we should have a default and <clears throat> i don't know about the rest of the committee but i don't believe that that's any of our business to tell towns how they should do their budgets because their budgets only affect them and their taxpayers. And I, if, if any, if people start suggesting that we um, have some kind of a default, if towns don't have their budgets, I, I would hope the committee would not support that. But I'd like to hear just so that we're clear about it before we go into the caucus. <laughs> Well, well, I would agree. I mean, this is the kind of thing we we tried to give them some more latitude in our ten pilot towns bill. You know that, so consistent with where we've been to let towns have more autonomy, not less. The idea of building a default for them, it's all doesn't make any sense. Allison. Well, you could make the same argument, Jeanette, that you just made about voters that the same is true for a school district but mm -hmm. we provide a school district default we provide a, a, a default i thought was a safety net not a, a you know that that if they failed for whatever reason to pass a new budget that the <coughs> old budget uh they could go forward with the old budget i don't I, that, uh, that's be, but that's because that's because the school budgets and and the school taxes actually affect other towns and other school districts and the statewide State. budget. The municipal budgets don't affect anybody yeah. except that municipality. Right. So uh, my tendency is to let the our pilots go forward and really push to well, get that bill out of the house. <laughs> and if that come, if that if this comes up, uh, uh, you know, I would be interested to see if towns had interest in in a default or not um that my guess is they don't they wouldn't they, why would they why would why would a town say oh yes state please set a default for right. us because we're I, too stupid to do it for ourselves sorry about that but i'm chris and then brian um so school budgets fail somewhat <laughs> regularly right so right. It's, i can see why we have a default built in so people aren't perpetually sort of crashing. But I am not aware, maybe Karen can fill us in. I don't remember hearing ever of a municipal budget failing, maybe. Well, they do <laughs> fail. They do fail occasionally. Colchester a few years ago had oh. both the town budget and the school budget fail. All right. I, re I remember. Lunen yeah, Lunenburg had their budget fail this year. I don't really know why, but they hmm. That's the one I've heard of this year. It's, um, you know, it's not that frequent, but it does happen. And, and Barry City's budgets have gone down in the past. Brian? And in Jeanette's case, no, Brian? Thank you. Um, I, I agree with you. I think there is an intersection between the school budgets and other communities. Yeah. They're, in, they're linked. You can't have one without another. So those are completely separate from what I'm envisioning here. I don't think we need to tie the hands of any municipality any more than we do. What if a, what if a town, for instance, wanted to make the budget lower than it was by default the year before? Which, in essence, in a very strange way, we'd be forcing a tax increase on people that might have voted to go the other way. So I let them do what they want to do with their own toys. And, and budgets fail if, if, if someone comes up with an idea that we're going to buy 18 new fire engines, that budget will probably fail and probably should. Or it may not. Or it may not. And that, but that's up to, the to people that um, live there. Podunk yep. Town because it doesn't affect the neighboring town or anybody else. Correct. Right. I think we're all in agreement. Okay. Anthony, I want to make sure. I, I agree. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, sure. before we, if this comes up, because it, it might, because it's been proposed by a couple people, 
that we're all kind of in agreement on this and we can all support the position that Brian is going to forcefully put forth. Well, the rest of them won't remember that we're all in GovOps. And so we'll just sort of randomly insert comments like, that's a great idea, Senator Collimore. And it will just uh, <laughs> build positive momentum. And <laughs> okay. Right. Good idea. But, okay. but what did you, what do you think they would, when you say they would support, like they would try to change the bill, in what way? That not to allow defaults, but to make sure that schools were in the same boat? No, no, no. What has been proposed is that we put in statute that if a town doesn't have a budget by July 1st, that the default is a certain percentage of their right, last right, year's right. budget. That Sure. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else we need to do here? We have just a couple minutes left before um, Tucker is going to join us.